So I think there's lots of evidence for this view that I'm putting forth, and there's a lot of I, what I take to be just wrong-headed criticism that I won't waste your time with. But there's one really smart criticism, um, which I take very seriously. Um, and that is that if you look at this picture sh that I showed you, first of all, um, you can see that there is, in fact, some response to non-faces, right? Um, and second of all, this, this whole line of argument comes from Jim here and many other people who've kind of taken this on, but it's really his thinking that's behind this. Um, he wrote a very influential article in 2001 um, where he pointed out that even if you look just within the face area, um, there's a fine-grained pattern of response across the voxels in that region, right? roughly 100 voxels. And that fine-grained pattern of response differs systematically for different categories. Right? So for example, if you scan people while they look at, uh, say, chairs and cars, and this is a schematic, imagine the, the fusiform face area flattened out, and this is the response of each voxel, it's just fake data. If you do this and you find that systematically those patterns differ, well then the face area contains information about the discrimination between chairs and cars. Right? And that's not faces. Okay? And there's lots of ways to show this. You can use simple correlation methods, as Haxby did. You can train up linear support machines. And you can do all kinds of other fancy things that you guys could invent better than I could, all of which are ways to look at that pattern and read out different information. Okay? And so this enterprise has been going on for a while. When Haxby first reported this, I said, well, you didn't define your fusiform face area right. And when I define it right, I don't see that. And then it went back and forth. And eventually, I said, whoops, actually, now at higher resolution, I do see it. You're right. And then he followed up with a paper saying, yes, but actually, that information is really weak. <laughs> so we met right in the middle. <laughs> it's there. It's significant. It's weak. But it's there. And to the extent that we think the brain is processing information, that's the uh, assumption of our whole field, uh, then we should care not just about how strong the response is. We should care even more about what information is in that region. And so this is a very important challenge. If there's information about other things beyond faces, who cares what the mean magnitude of response is? Okay, everybody feel the force of this? this is a serious concern? OK. Um, so uh, this is sometimes called multiple voxel pattern analysis, this business of looking at the fine-grained patterns. And it's gone wild. There's millions of uh, variations of it. And it's all very exciting and cool. It's very important because we do want to know not just what activates a region, but what it represents. And this is our main method. Could it be that there are more face features in the car? It could be any number of things. Any number of things. So I'm trying to like get you guys to see that this is a serious challenge, but not that there aren't ways of responding. Absolutely. Absolutely. All you'd have to do is say, yeah, the car is more face-like uh, than a chair is. And then you would be able to decode this. Right? And so then the real question is not what can we, the scientists, decode from that region, but what is the rest of the brain reading out from that region? Right? So this is where the causal tests become important. With functional MRI, we can't tell that. We can use fancier and fancier math to read out more and more impressive things out of a pattern of response across voxels. But then we have no idea if that's our prowess as neuroscientists reading that stuff out, or if that's actually what the rest of the brain is reading out of there as well. Okay? So mostly this is a big problem in actually also in systems neuroscientists science, but, um, but very in, in human cognitive neuroscience. So everybody's in the same boat. Um, uh, but in systems neuroscience, if you have a monkey, you can at least disrupt that region and look at behavior more often. And so you have more levers to go at. Um, with humans, um, we have a tough time, but I will show you a rare opportunity that I had. Um, did I give you this paper? I don't think I did. It just got accepted yesterday or something like that. Um, uh, so where we had an opportunity to test a patient with electrodes in his brain being mapped out before neurosurgery where the electrodes were placed right along the bottom surface of the brain, right in the regions that I care about. Um, and, um, and the uh, neurosurgeons decided medical reasons to electrically stimulate regions on the bottom of the brain uh, and ask the patient what happened. This is a way to test the causal role of those regions in, in perception. Okay, So I'm going to show you a video of that in a second, but let me give you a little more background. Just for comparison, that's the bottom of my brain there. Um, the red bits are my face selective bits. Uh, in the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. 
And this is the patient at the bottom of his brain, and each of those little things is an electrode that's been placed on the surface of the brain. This is very extreme neurosurgery. You hope this never happens to you or anyone you care about. But if you have intractable epilepsy, as this patient had, um, that was not treatable by drugs, this was, okay. Um, okay, so here's the patient. You'll meet him in a second. This was done in Japan. He's speaking Japanese, but you'll get the, there's subtitles, and you'll get the gist of what he's saying anyway. Um, okay, so the first thing we did was to record the responses of each of those electrodes to a bunch of different stimulus conditions. So we um, had, uh, we sent, a, I learned about that this was going to happen about 36 hours before it happened. And so everybody in my lab dropped everything to make stimuli um, and he may send them send them to Japan. Okay, so we presented stimuli that our bodies, faces, digit strings, um, uh, hiragana and kanji, two different kinds of Japanese characters, line drawings of objects, and photographs of objects. And we presented them both in color and grayscale. So this is not the causal test of the relationship to behavior. This is just mapping out the selectivity using electrodes, because this is a much more direct measure of neural activity than functional MRI. We're not going by way of the blood flow response. We're directly um, recording electrical responses on the surface of the brain. Okay. Um, and so uh, we can ask, what happens to that electrode right there that I've circled in red, which looks like it should be right around in the face area? Um, well, this is what happens. A humongous response to faces, a teeny tiny response to bodies, body parts and faces, and pretty much no response to anything else. Now, one thing you see here is that the selectivity of this response is much greater than I showed you with functional MRI. I think that's because we're actually recording the real deal with more precise methods that aren't blurred by blood flow that smears around in the brain and that are showing us a region that is actually really, really good for faces, right? I suspect that's true in all our functional MRI data as well. It just gets blurred by the method, yeah? So that's a nice reality check. Right next door, I mentioned briefly that right next to the um, face-preferring region is a color-preferring region. Um, and so right next door, that electrode does this. Okay, now what these bars mean is the outer bar is a response to that condition when it's in color, and the inner bar is when it's presented in grayscale. And so you can see that across all the different stimulus categories, that electrode responds more to the color version than the grayscale version. So it's got some preference for color. Now, you'll also notice that the preference for color in the color electrode is weaker than the preference for faces in the face electrode. Okay, so my terminology is that's face selective and this is color preferring. It's a fine point to avoid hassle from colleagues. You guys don't care about that. Anyway, just note that it's slightly weaker. Okay, so, so far, that's nice, but all we here is replicate with electrical recording what we found previously with functional MRI. But that's great. As a friend of mine says, I'm a replication junkie. Um, we don't have enough of this in science, and especially when you replicate with a totally different method, indeed a better method, it's a fabulous thing. Nonetheless, the real question I started off with is what's the causal role of these regions? So now that we've established the selectivities of these electrodes, now we can ask what happens when they're electrically stimulated, okay? And so I'll show you. We'll start with electrical stimulation of the um, face selective electrode, that electrode right over there. Um, now realize this doesn't know there's a face selective region, has no idea which electrode is being stimulated. Uh, and is just asked to report what he experiences. Now, I'll say that we weren't the first to try this. There's several papers um, that re both record electrical activity and also stimulate regions here and nearby that have already shown the causal role of face selective sites in face perception. Okay, that's really important, and you'll see it in my data too in a second. But my real agenda, since that had sort of been shown, was to address this challenge uh, from Jim Haxby and others. If there's information in the fine-grained pattern of response across that region about things that aren't faces, then surely if we hit that region with a big sledgehammer by putting in a big current right there, that should disrupt that fine-grained pattern. And therefore, it should mess up the perception of other things that aren't faces. That was the key question. Okay, So I'll show you what happens uh, when this guy is stimulated while looking at faces and what happens when he's stimulated there while looking at things that aren't faces. All right. Here we go. Okay, so he's looking at a face and he's getting stimulated right on the face selective electrode and he says, he's completely changed.
ってんのそうですまた口が来たんだ違う人になりますどんな感じ顔が変わってないんですけど目が、まあ、言葉で合わせてないですねもう一回やってもう一回Such a great subject. He's just trying to get it right, you know? Okay, so he's getting zapped again right there. Okay, so now he's looking at a box, okay? And he's going to get in the same electrode right there. Okay, so then he's looking at a round object. We thought maybe he'd be more likely to f that. Okay, this is a kanji character on a, it's foreshortened, you'll see it in a second. So the point is, one, that region is causally involved in face perception. It doesn't just turn on when you look at faces and for some epiphenomenal reason. It's actually causally involved in that if you directly reach in and activate those neurons, the person sees a face. But at least as importantly, even though Haxby and others, including me, have shown that that region contains fine-grained information about other things beyond faces, if you read it out, you can, you can read it out. When you give it, when you ask him how stimulation of that region affects perception of something that isn't a face, it doesn't do anything other than stick a face on top. And so, to me, this is um, pretty strong evidence that even if there is fine-grained information in there, it's probably not being read out, or it's not playing a major role because we radically disrupted it, and apparently nothing happened to the percept of the non-face object. Yeah. Speak up. Yeah, that would be very interesting. It'd be interesting to do that and to have him look at a blank page. We didn't have time to do any of that. So, you know, these, these experiments, you know, I'll never get another shot at this. Like, this, these experiments are really rare and just, this is like, you know, pretty much never happens. And when it happens, there's just a tiny little window. We have, you know, 40 minutes of data total, that's it. So yeah, there are lots, I really wish I had been there to ask him in more detail, like really t tell me about the shape of the box. Tell me about the shape of the ball. Did anything about the box or the ball or the kanji itself change? As far as I can tell from the transcript, and we have, um, I think, eight stimulations on, uh, I forget how many, uh, we have quite a few. As far as I can tell, nothing about the non face objects changed. They're just face things on top. But it would be nice to interrogate further. Yeah, the face was sideways. I have no idea why. I think that's very interesting, but I don't know. Um, okay, so we're, I'm almost done and we'll have a break, but let me just show you something else first. So that's what happens when you stimulate that region. It shows the causal role of that region in face perception, and I would argue the pretty much exclusive causal role of that region in face perception. Notice he could have reported anything else. He was asked to report anything that changed, and he didn't report anything else other than seeing a face. Um, but we're social primates. We see faces in clouds. We see faces all the time when they're not there. Maybe any damn thing you do to the brain makes you see a face. Maybe you see a face, right? 
So let's ask what happens in other electrodes. And in fact, let's ask what happens when you stimulate right next door in this electrode that responds preferentially to color. OK, here's what happens. He's looking at the box, <coughs> getting stimulated. No, it's kind of an old box, so there's texture, but there's no image on it. Is that crazy or what? That's the kanji. So that shows um, that conversely, this region is causally involved in color perception. Um, and importantly, it's right next door. It's like a centimeter away from the face selective electrode. And that also shows you that it's not just that if you stimulate anywhere in the vicinity, you get the same thing. Instead, what we see here is a fine-grained functional organization that corresponds to what was seen before with functional MRI, and where we now have the ability to show the causal role plus the specificity of that causal role. Yeah? Do you have any idea what flies Yes. Yes, because um, each side of the brain, in, especially in perceptual regions, responds to the opposite side of space. He's stimulated in his right fusiform gyrus. That's why he sees color on the left. 